Now we are going to learn the Cauchy stress tetrahedron. This is very important as important as the Mohr circle of stress. Let us try to understand what is given and what is to be found out in this case. Consider we have got a tetrahedron where the corner points are B, A, O and C. So a tetrahedron is given and on its three surfaces on O, A, B surface on O B C surface and on O A C surface normal stress and shear stresses are acting. This is the given information. The another given information is that this tetrahedron is not moving, is not rotating and it is also quite a small tetrahedron. It is in a stable condition. We have considered O X 1, O X 2 and O X 3 as the three perpendicular axes and Using them actually the tetrahedron has been defined. The different three different faces are to be well understood on which the stresses sigma ij are acting. Let us take first the O A B plane. This is basically same as the x1 x2 plane which is same as saying like this is the x3 plane. So, O A B plane is equal to the x3 plane is equal to the x1 x2 plane and on this there are three stresses acting. I have shown them as sigma 3 2, sigma 3 1 and sigma 3 3. Now we will recollect this symbol sigma ij. So to recollect I am taking you back to this small cube on which the stress resolution was done and on which we defined the sigma ij. What we did there? We considered sigma i when I write i as subscript the first subscript indicates that sigma ij lies on a plane which is perpendicular to axis i. Now in this particular case the plane which I can mark over here this plane is perpendicular to axis 1. So therefore stresses acting on this plane will be represented by sigma 1 i is equal to 1. Then j was told in this way sigma ij here sigma ij acts along the j axis. Now if there is a stress acting on this plane which is normal and along the axis 1 this will be called as sigma 1 1. This is a normal stress acting on plane 1 or we can say plane 2 3. Now the next thing is imagine this stress which is acting on this plane 1. So I have to write sigma 1 and it is acting towards direction 2. So I have to write sigma 1 2 this shear stress is understood. I have another shear stress here if I consider this is lying on plane 1. So I have to write it as sigma 1. Now we can see it is acting towards direction 3 towards the negative side of direction 3. So I can write as sigma 1 3 and magnitude wise I can take minus. If I am taking this value sigma 1 2 as positive going towards positive side this I can take negative in certain calculations. And if you argue right now that this is the cube where we are working axis 1, axis 2 and axis 3 and on the plane 1 that means on the plane 2, 3 that means this particular plane if there is a stress acting like that what would be what it would be called it can be called sigma i but then this direction is neither parallel to 2 nor parallel to 3 yet it is a shear stress. So we cannot call sigma 1 2 we cannot say neither we can call it sigma 1 3. So I can call it sigma 1 let us say m and we define m is a direction which is neither parallel to 2 nor parallel to direction 3. Now that we have recollected how the sigma ij symbols are used the same is applied on this tetrahedron. We start with first this O x2 and x1 plane or O a b plane. Note that there is a normal stress acting on it. 
So, I have to write sigma 3 because this plane OAB perpendicular to the x3 direction and then this direction is actually parallel to the x3. So, I wrote 3 sigma 3 3 is the normal stress. Now, think that on this plane we are applying a shear and how it will be recognized? It is acting on plane perpendicular to direction 3 or x3 so sigma 3 and it is acting towards direction 1 so it is 1. Take this one sigma 3 is understood and it is acting towards direction 2 so it is sigma 3 2. Now students have to take time to individually understand sigma 2 1, sigma 2 2, sigma 2 3, sigma 1 3, sigma 1 1 and sigma 1 2. Quickly if I tell you these three stresses sigma 2 3, sigma 2 2 and sigma 2 1 are acting on the plane C O A. Now this C O A plane is perpendicular to direction 2. So in all cases sigma 2 is stated where 2 is the first suffix. Next this stress is a shear stress and that acts along x3 direction. So I write 2 3. Then this is a shear stress that acts along direction 1. So I write it 2 1 and this white arrow indicates a normal stress sigma 2 2. Note that whenever it is a normal stress I have used the white color chalk sigma 1 1, sigma 3 3 and sigma 2 2. Okay, now let us come to this phase. C O B plane is perpendicular to x1 axis. So the first suffix has to be 1. So you see sigma 1 and something sigma 1 and something and sigma 1 and something. Now this normal stress is acting parallel to x1 axis that is why we call it sigma 1 1. This shear stress is acting along direction 3. So the second suffix is 3 which makes it sigma 1 3. Here the shear stress is acting parallel to x2 direction. So I write the second suffix as 2 which makes it sigma 1 2 stress component. So in this way the different stress components have been made and the nomenclature is same as the convention that we followed for the cube. So what we said if I write down on x3 plane that is on x1 x2 plane sigma 1 3 1, sigma 3 2 and sigma 3 3 are acting. So we can summarize them as sigma 3 j, j equal to 1 2 3 and on x1 plane which is same as x2 x3 plane sigma 1 1, sigma 1 2 and sigma 1 3 are acting which I can summarize as sigma 1 j where j can be 1, 2 or 3 and on the x2 plane which is same as the x1 x3 plane sigma 2 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 2 3 are acting. In other words I can present in a compact way sigma 2 j are acting where j runs from 1, 2 and 3. Now that we have understood the symbols sigma ij, let us recollect what else is happening on this tetrahedron. Here is a stress acting on the ABC plane and this stress P is not acting on the OAB plane or OBC plane or OCA plane. This stress is incident on the ABC plane itself. Second, we consider an outward unit vector which is normal to this ABC plane given by N. N is not a stress that is applied on the body. N is a unit vector which is perpendicular to ABC plane and passing through O. It is required. Consider this N has a direction cosine L1, L2 and L3. And we know once we write this thing, it means L1 square plus L2 square plus L3 square is equal to 1. Another point again to recollect that once we say this vector n is perpendicular to this ABC plane, it means that in terms of structural geology, this line can be considered as pole of the ABC plane. And we are further considering that pole is passing through point O. Now let us look here say A is the area of the ABC plane. This plane ABC plane has an area of capital A. Now it can be demonstrated from the coordinate geometry study that the area of the plane OAB 
O A B that means the x3 plane or the x1 x2 plane is given by L3 multiplied by A. Here note once we say x3 plane this suffix 3 and that 3 has come over here. The area of the OBC plane can be demonstrated from coordinate geometry study is equal to L1 A where is OBC here O B and C. OBC plane can be called an x1 plane note this suffix 1 is here and here we have got L1. OCA plane has an area of L2 multiplied by A. What is OCA plane here? OCA. This OCA plane is perpendicular to X2 plane and note that this suffix 2 is reflected here as 2. Now if we are thinking that there is a stress P acting on the ABC plane that is counteracting the movement rotation of the small tetrahedron, we can think that this P has components along direction 1, along direction x1 as P1, along direction 2 as P2 and along direction 3 as P3. So, these are the vectors or we can think as second rank tensors as well. So, magnitude wise P will be equal to P1 square magnitude square of P1 magnitude square of P2's magnitude and square of P3's magnitude. Now from the areas of these, under, uh, these planes that is understood how much are the forces acting on OAB plane, OBC plane and OCA plane. On the OAB plane, on the OAB plane sigma 3 2, sigma 3 3 and sigma 3 1 are acting. If I multiply by the area of OAB that means L 3 A I will get the force that is acting that means I will be getting F 3 1, F 3 3 and F 3 2 and that is what has been done here. We have multiplied L 3 A and I get L 3 A sigma 3 2, L 3 A sigma 3 1, L 3 A sigma 3 3. What is the common thing here? When it is 3 it is over here 3 and 3 is always the first suffix. Okay. Now we will find out how much is the force or the different components of forces acting on the OBC plane. OBC plane has got area of L1 A and here where is the OBC plane O, B and C. These are the three components acting sigma 1 2, sigma 1 1 and sigma 1 3. What is common in them? The first suffix is common sigma 1 in all the cases. So these multiplied by the area of O, B, C will give the forces F1 3, F1 1 and F1 2 and that is what has been done L1 A multiplied by sigma 1 1, L1 A multiplied by sigma 1 2 and L1 A multiplied by sigma 1 3. Similarly, the area of OCA plane is known L2 A. The force acting on the OCA plane can be calculated. Where is the OCA plane? OCA. What is common there? 2 is the first suffix in all of them. So, for example, 2 1, 2 2 and 2 3. So, if I multiply these stresses by the area of OCA which is L2 A, I will get the forces acting along those directions which is L2 A sigma 2 1, L2 A sigma 2 2 and L2 A sigma 2 3. What is common here? This 2 is common in all the cases. So, now we are going to find out how much is the total force acting along the x1 axis, how much is the total force acting along the y1 axis or sorry x2 axis and how much is the total force acting along the x3 axis then we will make a force balance. Just like we did in case of Mohr circle, Mohr's problem of stress, we made force balance not the stress balance. That is what we are going to do. So, the total force acting along the x1 axis is to be found out. What do we do for that? Sigma 3 1, here sigma 3 1 means as I told you the second suffix means along direction 1 this stress is acting. Now this is the total force that is acting along direction 1. So I can write here sigma 1 1. AL1 this time I am picking up from the OBC plane this component plus 
sigma 2 1 a l 2 this time I am picking up from the OCA plane and then from OAB plane sigma 3 1 a l 3 this has been picked up. What is common in these expressions note that the second suffix of sigma always is 1 that means along direction 1 these are the forces that are acting and I said that there is also a p component of stress acting on the ABC plane and that has been resolved along 1, 2 and 3 direction. So, P1 multiplied by A will be same as this if there is no rotation and no movement of the small tetrahedron. So, this is the expression. Similarly, the total force acting along the x2 axis can be worked out. It is here sigma 1 to AL1 note these two means the along direction 2 this is the force acting plus sigma 2 to AL2 these two indicates this force is acting towards direction 2 plus sigma 3 to AL3 note these two again indicates along the direction 2 this amount of force is acting. From where I got this information from here we have picked up sigma 1 to AL1 we can find out sigma 1 to AL1 is picked up from here plus sigma 2 to AL2 sigma 2 to AL2 plus sigma 3 to AL3 is picked up from there. So, that is equal to P2A. What is P2A? Due to the application of the P2 amount of stress along direction 2 P2A is the amount of force that is applied. So, here we are finding out the from the sigma ij basically how much is the total force acting along direction x2 and on another phase ABC when P stress is applied then P2 is the component along direction 2 then P2 multiplied by A is the force along direction 2 we are saying they have to balance otherwise the tetrahedron will move or it will rotate. Similarly, the force balance along direction x3 axis we will do. For that what we do we choose those sigma ij values where 3 is the second suffix and I told you already that when we write sigma ij j means along the direction axis j the stress is acting. So, here sigma 1 3 a l 1 is the force that is acting along direction 3 where did I get sigma 1 3 a l 1 we are getting it from here in this row we will get sigma 1 3 a l 1 it is from here plus sigma 2 3 a l 2 where do I get sigma 2 3 a l 2 it is here sigma 2 3 a l 2 plus sigma 3 3 a l 3 where do I get it sigma 3 3 a l 3 is over there. So, what has happened all these 9 components of forces have been now taken care 3 at a time and in this way. So, from here we are getting basically 3 equations but before we move ahead there is a word of caution. So, we have deduced the 3 force balance equations shown by these white ticks. Consider the weight of the tetrahedron which is force is equal to mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. The mass of the tetrahedron can be represented as one third multiplied by area of the ABC surface ABC surface multiplied by h. h is the perpendicular distance between the origin and the ABC surface that is what I am writing perpendicular distance between origin and the ABC plane multiplied by G that remains same and then comes a rho, rho is the density of the tetrahedron. So, one third AH basically gives the volume multiplied by the density gives the mass and then multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity gives the weight which is acting vertically down. So, that means which is acting along the x3 direction which has not been considered in this equation we do not see any of the f equal to mg term there. Now, consider that this h is very small it is so small it is a fraction. So, f becomes effectively equal to 0 or think that the density of this tetrahedron is is very very low number very small number. So, in these ways we can think that the force is equal to 0 if force is equal to 0 then only the equation is correct. So, if I show you P 3 A is equal to this and hide this one this is correct, but the moment you bring the along direction 3 that means along vertical axis 
there is a weight which is working downward then one third a h rho g has to be added up in the expression. So this is a very important thing that has to be remembered and needless to mention that this area gets cancelled out in all the sides. We are not taking forward with this equation one third h rho g considering h is very small but if h is not very small or in other words f having a significant magnitude then this has to be added up in all the subsequent works as per the need. But our common need is such that in the mechanical problem that we can ignore h taking like h equal to almost 0. So, f is taken as 0. So, this was about the weight. What about this is a tetrahedron let us say it is a magnetic material and I have put a magnet over there. So, let us say this tetrahedron is attract, attracted in some direction magnetic force is acting magnetic force may act along only x2 direction only along x1 direction if the magnet is kept suitably or along x3 direction but it is also possible the magnet is kept like I am showing these are the three axes and the magnet is kept here and here is the attraction. In that case the magnetic force has to be resolved along x1, x2 and x3 direction and has to be taken care in the way I have taken care the P3A equal to etc. So, that has to be taken care or imagine any other field that is acting on it leading to some force that force must be taken care in these equations. Now, having said this it is clearly understood from these three equations we can write a matrix ok. So, for a small tetrahedron we can write the three equations that were deduced as P1, P2, P3 is equal to sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 1, sigma 3, 1, sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 2, sigma 2, 3 and this will be sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 3 and sigma 3, 3 and here is L1, L2 and L3. Just to recollect the L1, L2, L3 or the Li are the direction cosines of the unit vector normal to the ABC plane what was defined already. And these three equations can be further shortened as P i equal to sigma j i l j or we can write sigma j i as sigma i j and transpose of it. Let us try to understand how this works. Consider i is equal to 1. Now, I will write j equal to 1, 2 and 3 and then it will come to the first expression that j equal to 1 sigma 1 1 l 1 plus j equal to 2 sigma 2 1 l 2 plus j equal to 3 sigma 3 1 l 3. So, it comes here p 1 equal to sigma 1 1 l 1 plus sigma 2 1 l 2 plus sigma 3 1 l 3. Similarly, by putting i equal to 2 and i equal to 3 we can get the desired expressions. So, once this is understood that is also understood. So, here basically we have called this matrix as sigma j i or we can write it as sigma i j transpose. In some book this matrix has been called as a stress tensor and sometimes its transpose has been called also as a stress tensor in some other literature. Now, having said this let us think about this one coordinate axis O x i were chosen arbitrarily. When the tetrahedron drawing was done O x 1, O x 2 and O x 3 were done arbitrarily. But the stress regime can remain the same that means the lines of action of sigma i j can remain the same. The line of action of P stress can remain the same but the three coordinate axes can be chosen differently yet maintaining mutual perpendicular relationship. So, in that case for any rotated coordinate system we can write sigma dash p q equal to l i p l j q sigma i j. Sigma i j here is the coordinate system on which the definition has been made and sigma dash p q is the new coordinate system. Let us try to understand it by putting p equal to q equal to 1 sigma dash 1 1 equal to l i p 
equal to 1 so l i 1 plus l j q becomes l j 1 because j is also q is also taken as 1 multiplied by sigma i j. Now we will write i equal to 1 l 1 1 l j 1 and then sigma 1 j. Now I will write i equal to 2 l 2 1 l j 1 sigma i 2 plus l 3 1. Now i is taken as 3 then l j 1 and then sigma 3 j. Once this is being done now j can be put as 1 2 and 3. So, 3 terms will come out from here this j and here we will put again j equal to 1 j equal to 2 and j equal to 3. So, 3 terms will come out and from here j equal to 1 j equal to 2 and j equal to 3 will give another 3 terms a correction. Let us again come back to this matrix and try to understand row wise what does this mean all stresses acting along direction 1 because 1 is a second suffix here all the stresses acting along sigma 1 2. So, this row indicates sigma 1 2 2 2 and here is a correction it will be sigma 3 2 all the stresses acting along direction 2 and here the third row indicates all the stresses acting along the coordinate axis 3 these are the meanings of the rows let us take the columns what does this mean all these stresses are acting on the x1 plane because you see the first suffix is 1 here all these stresses are acting on the x2 plane because the first suffix is 2 and here all these stresses are acting along acting on the x3 plane because you see this is 3 as the first suffix. Now, with this we are going to find out various interesting relationships taking this as the starting point. We did a force balance for the Cauchy stress tetrahedron case and then we arrived at a matrix relationship in terms of three equations represented in this way. Now, the question raised is that can we find out the three perpendicular axis in that stress regime where sigma ij is acting so that those three perpendicular axis can be called as the principal axis of stress. This means that perpendicular to those three lines if we consider three planes the shear stress will vanish on those planes. To do this we proceed in this way consider sigma is the principal stress that basically counteracts the sigma ij stress that has been imposed on the three faces of the tetrahedron. Now the component of sigma along the ox1, ox2 and the ox3 axis will be given by p1 equal to sigma l1, p2 equal to sigma l2 and p3 equal to sigma l3. And we have already these three equations with us which is basically also represented in this matrix. Now, here we are equating this p1 with the p1, this p2 with that p2, this p3 with that p3. In other words, when we were thinking that there was a p stress that is counteracting the tetrahedron from rotating and was making a finally force balance that p is equated with this stress. So, once in this equation we put this, once in this equation we put that and when we put in this equation p3 equal to that we finally can find out this determinant sigma 1 1 minus sigma, sigma 1 2 sigma 1 3, sigma 2 1, sigma 2 2 minus sigma sigma 2 3 and sigma 3 1 sigma 3 2 and sigma 3 3 minus sigma is equal to 0. The basic assumption is that L1, L2, L3, 3 of them cannot be 0. So, that is why what is possible in that case is this determinant becomes equal to 0. Now, if we can solve this sigma we will find out the principal axis magnitudes. So, expanding it we can write sigma cube minus i 1 sigma square plus i 2 sigma minus i 3 equal to 0 we call it the characteristic equation and here i 1 i 2 i 3 represented as i i are the invariants which means whatever be the three coordinate axis we choose which are mutually perpendicular to define the x y z axis in this equation the i 1 i 2 and the i 3 values will remain as it is. Now, from the cubic equation relationship one can find out that the i 1 
is equal to sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3. Note that this i1 is not the trace of the matrix. If I add 3 of them, it will be sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 minus 3 sigma. Here is no such minus 3 sigma term. Next i2 is equal to sigma 1 1 sigma 1 2 and then 1 2 and 2 2 then sigma 1 1 sigma 3 3 3 1 at both places sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 and sigma 2 3 at both the places and if it is expanded we get basically sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 plus sigma 2 2 sigma 3 3 plus sigma 3 3 sigma 1 1 minus sigma 1 2 square plus here so basically it will be minus sigma 2 3 square and sigma 3 1 square i3 will be a very lengthy expression it is given by a determinant sigma 1 1 1 2 3 1 1 2 2 2 2 3 3 1 2 3 3 3 note that here is sigma 3 1 and sigma 3 1 so sigma 1 3 term is not there ok so once this cubic equation is solved the three values of sigma are obtained we call them as the eigen values and we can write in this way sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3 so starting from the Cauchy stress tetrahedron, we found the magnitude of the principal stresses in three perpendicular directions. Now imagine instead of such a big stress matrix 3 into 3, we are dealing with a case of 2 into 2 stress matrix. In other words, sigma 3 1, sigma 3 2, sigma 3 3 are all zeros and sigma 1 3, sigma 2 3 and sigma that one is also zero. That means stresses are acting only along direction 1 and direction 2. That is another consideration that sigma ij equal to sigma ji so that the material does not rotate that is also considered. So in this case the matrix simplifies to this form. Which I have written separately over there sigma 1 1 sigma 1 2 sigma 1 2 and sigma 2 2. So, this is a special case, but it is also worth seeing how simply how much simplification can be done. So, in this case i 1 will become earlier it was these 3 being added up sigma 3 3 is 0. So, here it is sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 and i 2 which was here this expression now simplifies to minus sigma 1 2 square plus sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 fine and I3 what it will be here are the different stress components if we look at this and also look at these zeros then we understand which are to be considered as zeros and indeed these elements are zeros. So therefore for this determinant it turns out to be 0. Now I1, I2, I3 are understood in this case. We will now look at the characteristic equation this was a equation basically this was the equation i3 has become 0. So, that is what I am writing here sigma cube minus i1 sigma square plus i2 sigma equal to 0. Now, we negate a chance that sigma can be 0. So, dividing by sigma sigma square minus i1 sigma plus i2 equal to 0. Now, as a request for to the students that from this quadratic equation write down sigma 1 and sigma 2 as functions of sigma 1 1 sigma 1 2 and sigma 1 2 I have written twice. So, it can be avoided sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2. 